Hello, and welcome to Health and Fitness Redefined. I'm your host, Anthony Amen. Join me today as we take a dive into the world of health and fitness, where we learn to overcome adversity to pick the fact versus fiction and see health and fitness in a whole new light. I hope you guys had an absolutely fantastic Christmas. I know we're just coming out of it. We're hopping into the new year. So our next episode is going to come out in 2022. Crazy we've been doing this for two years, guys. And thank you so much for sticking with me. And I know this probably isn't the episode that you want to hear the week between Christmas and New Year's all about how maybe you shouldn't be eating too much cake. But I think it's important. I'm excited to do it. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Vlado Bozanek. Vlado, welcome and thank you for doing this today. Appreciate it. And it's an absolute pleasure all the way from down under. All the way from Australia. We were chatting earlier. I'm drinking my coffee and you're like, please, I want to go to bed. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, so before we really talk about body composition and all this stuff that everyone wants to hear just two days after Christmas. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you got into this? Because you didn't do this your whole life, correct? Absolutely not. No, it's, uh, it's been a journey. So, you know, if you went through the, the, let's call it the algorithm of life. I, I was a competitive bodybuilder in my younger days. I, um, went into a number of different things, but sort of landed in, in the world of, you know, venture capital investment banking um that's 30 years in now doing that and um then found myself uh in an idea of mine back in 2014 which is what we're going to discuss today which is right in your lane it's right in the, the world of health and fitness and and your listeners uh, that um you know we live in that world of wanting to take care of ourselves and and uh, be able to check that those changes and, and those um that that progress is happening so we've created a digital tool to help them do that. And you're right, we're, we're at the wrong end of the year after all the cake and turkey and great food to be uh, talking about measuring the changes because they're, they're going to be on the negative side of, of that. But uh, it'll be fun. We'll do a deep dive and I'm sure they'll enjoy it. Yeah, I, I just think the most important part, and it's going to tie into the episode that's going to come out in the following week, which is setting goals and having an understanding of how you can make 2022 the best version of you. And I think that's the most important part. And this is exactly where we need to start because you need to have an understanding about your body. I think that's the most important thing is everybody's different, right? 100%. And we all go into the new year with these resolutions, right? And how many of us stick it out? And uh, what, what we have here is an opportunity to actually define change, set the pace, decide where you're at and what I'm going to do about it. And, and again, um, not reflecting on what we do too much, but until we get deeper into the show, but we, we've created a tool that makes you accountable to yourself very privately. So uh, being an ex-fitness fanatic and understanding the ego involved in trying to look good all the time, because let's face it, you know, fitness is driven by vanity. We don't do it for, for many other reasons. You know, generally, if we're doing it just for our health, it's because something happened, but you know, when you started from a younger age like you and I did, or maybe me a lot younger than you, um, we, we we do it for a reason for ourselves. You know, it's about self-confidence, about looking great, fitting in the clothes the way you want to and so on. So start of the year is a great time to kick it out. Yeah, definitely. Mine's more for uh, preventing migraines, but <laughs> totally understand a little bit more, a little bit of that, any, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. But you definitely see that a little bit through and through. And I think this is a very important topic, and I'm just going to jump right into it. I, ha I have fights with, not fights, fights is a bad word, but it's hard to convince clients when they're coming into the gym to take their scales, bash it against the wall, break them, and then throw them away and never buy one again. And I want you to kind of talk to us through the difference about why I'm saying that and give us some insight. It's funny you say that because I, I wrote an article a few years ago called Mass Versus Measure. And the reason I wrote that was to really look at why do we jump on the scale? Because the scale doesn't define us. Um, and certainly I've got a Croatian background and uh, mum used to say we're all heavy boned. Uh, but the, the fact is we, we're just pretty solid guys and um, we, we grow up that way. But you, you jump on the scale and you do all that work and 
it fluctuates and it's all over the place. Now you have all these new impeded scales that do all sorts of weird and wonderful things as well from, from a body composition and fluid and, and so on perspective. If you use them properly, they're a fantastic tool. But um, people think jumping on them is using them properly and it's not. There's so much more to it. So I, I've really, if you like, redefined what, what I think is the right way to, to look at the mass of your body, and that is through dimension because weight is a single factor, whereas when you look at body composition, when you look at dimension, when you look at the, the way that you bring that data together and what it means truly to you as an individual, it's a long way from being just 92 kilos on a scale. That really tells me very little about my health, my wellness, and where I am in my life. Yeah, definitely. And the, our biggest talking point, which is kind of what you said, is body fat composition. So how much of your weight is fat? If you're looking at a scale weight for, say, like, I'm just under 200 pounds. And I tell people that and they look at me like I have five heads. Like, there's no way you're that much weight. I was like, yeah, but because muscle is more dense than fat. So you have a lot of it. And then your scale weight goes up. They say it's heavier than, but a pound's a pound kind of talk. So that's something that I've always thought should be introduced into the medical field is let's stop checking BMI. BMI maybe for a mass over a million people is relevant, but it's not relevant for an individual. And healthcare is supposed to be based upon an individual care basis. You're like nodding your head. So I want you to talk a little bit more about what you think the medical field should take with this. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm a real disbeliever in BMI because when you look at you know, just your body weight, you would probably be classified as obese because for your height and your weight, because the amount of muscle you're carrying, it puts you into the wrong category because basically your BMI is a calculation of your weight and your height and your gender, they look at it and it sets you into some parameters, but it doesn't understand what is your waistline, what is your sexual adiposity, you know, where where is the risky weight being held on your body? If you're a lean 200 pounds versus Uncle Tony, being a heavy 200 pounds with more body fat, there's a real differentiator in that. And that's where the medical fraternity now is really taking a hard swing into being, if you like, more in tune with waistline or circumference of, of a person's what they call medical waistline, not your pants size as medical waistline, that really does determine the risk that you're under more so in the medical field than BMI because they know BMI is horribly wrong. Yeah, and our biggest... You know, when I love how you brought up waistline, they always talk about how men are more likely to have cardiovascular disease than women. It's because men, we're going to store our fat in our guts where women's going to store the fat in their hips and thighs. That's just genetic predisposition. So when we get this fat building up in our guts, right, you got to imagine fat doesn't grow in one direction. It just doesn't grow out. <laughs> it's more like a circular kind of figure. So it's going to grow out, in, up, down, around. Now it's putting all that pressure on your heart and it's just suffocating you basically and you're throwing your diaphragm all the way up and that's you're going to get sick you're going to have heart attacks you're going to have a lot of this that's why men are way more at risk than women are but you're starting to see a turn because of the obesity rate going way up but something we really need to just take in consideration besides just scale weight absolutely and the, the piece that that puzzle that a lot of people don't understand because it's just not at the forefront of the information you see in the public sector is the visceral fat. It's that horrible, sticky yellow fat that's around your organs. That's the fat that's growing inside, not just, you know, that you feel around your stomach and things. It's it's that fat that, you know, from soft drinks and, you know, bread and all those yummy pastas and things that we love to eat, you know, that high carb diet that, you know, puts the fats and makes you retain them. So it, it's, um, it's that fat that you've really got to worry about. And that's where men suffer from it we have much higher visceral fat levels than women. So when you look at that and you bring that into the equation, you're then layering up type 2 diabetes and, and the rest of that. Now, you bring COVID into that and the amount of sedentary behaviour happening now because we're at home more and we're not getting out as much and this is how we're communicating on these calls more so than going out to see people with all the shutdowns and things that are happening and then this new strain has hit so people are slowing down again. Um, it, it's just a compounding effect. It, it is... Um, yeah, obesity to me is a pandemic that nobody's listened to. It's there. It's just coming and it's growing. And in Australia, in the US, you know, you see it when you're walking down the street, the amount of extra weight we carry because of our eating habits and the way we, we have our lifestyles and other parts of the world, you go into them, they're much slimmer people because they're more active 
and they don't have the huge surges of food that we love to devour, right? Yeah, I'm gonna, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but now that you mentioned it, <laughs> two points. One, visceral fat is something you talked about. I'm gonna dive really just very little into. It's the reason that even if we all know the skinny guy that doesn't work out, eats whatever he wants, and everyone says, oh, you're skinny, you don't need to work out, you're healthy. That is so not true. You can have high levels of visceral fat and have a high body fat percentage, which yet again shows how body BMI is inaccurate and actually be at a way greater risk of having issues down the line than somebody that may show an extra few pounds and may even just look heavier. That's the yeah. first point. And then, boy, am I bitter, Vlado. And uh, if you want, I want my listeners that have listened to the show from the way back to May of 2020. I did a COVID episode all about how COVID is a case of the obese. And if there was no obese problem, there'd be no COVID problem. And I got a lot of backlash, a lot, because I was making assumptions. I just want to point out that last week, I guess one week ago from today, they finally published an article in the Journal of Medicine stating that COVID attacks fat cells, makes the obese sicker, and is a way greater risk for the obese population than it is for everybody else. So if we fix the underlying condition of obesity, then maybe COVID wouldn't be what it is today. Well, I, I agree. And what you've got to look at is the comorbidities related to the higher death or mortality rates in COVID-19 are directly correlated to the people that are carrying more weight than the people that are healthier and, and fitter because their immune systems are weaker as well because that additional fat creates just a domino effect of issues within your body. And uh, if you're carrying too much weight and you're you know, subjected to, you know, uh, respiratory issues, heart issues, renal failure, all of these things that come with the obesity problems, you get sick with something like COVID, your chance of fighting it is much, much lower because your immune system just isn't as strong or able to take that uh, against someone like yourself who's lean, you know, heavily muscled, trains hard, you've got a different immune system. Doesn't mean you're not gonna get sick, but your chances of mortality are lower, which they've proven um, is the case. So. They, you know, it, it's something they've got to pay attention to. And I'm not fat bashing, don't get me wrong, because I I lost a lot of weight over COVID. I dropped 20 kilos. So wow. it's at about 35 pounds in your world. So, it, and it was because I'd, I'd actually stopped traveling, stopped eating all that great food and sitting on 20 hour flights back and forth from the US and thought I better pull up and, and lose a bit of weight. So it's one of those things you've got to pay attention to because it affects you later in life. Yeah, and there's, I don't believe in, Fat shaming, there's a totally different scenario between somebody who is trying to lose the weight, working out and trying to take care of themselves, which is amazing. That is absolutely amazing and all the power to you to the point of just being in disbelief that being obese is going to cause issues down the line. There's two totally different mindsets, two totally different people. And that's really what I think we're both talking about. But I want to bring it back to body composition a little bit more. I'm going to ask you a two part question here. So the first part is, what do you think for your average person that doesn't have access to anything like scales or blah, 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 what they should keep measures on? And two, if you really wanted to dive into what your body composition and what factors should you be looking at? Well, listen, on the first point, I think waistline is one of the premium measurements that you should understand. You should understand the implications of what your current waistline is and then every centimeter of of, um, of additional waistline you add over years and, and then calculating that over three to five years the impact that that has on, on your overall health because we really are talking about you know the the higher mortality rates in just the world let's forget about the pandemic let's just talk about 70 percent of deaths each year are from chronic diseases that are manageable chronic diseases most of those diseases are, are, if you like, brought on by too much body fat. It, it's actually, it brings the whole body back into a into a, a lesser state of being able to cope and its immune system drops. So when, and I'm not a health expert, so I wanna be careful about what, what I'm saying. It, this, it, this is a life experience and just the last five years of data collections that we've done for the company and the way we've used our internal scientists and uh, data analysts to look at 
the global data and what has been drawn together from that data to understand what other things we should be looking at and measuring and assisting people in the easiest way to do that. So A, they understand what their dimension is correlation to risk is, where they sit in a risk curve and then what they should do about that to uh, to reduce their risk. And we found that it's a, it's a very progressive tool and uh, it really changes people's mindset on how they approach things. So um, hopefully that answers the first part of your question. Definitely. Uh, I'll get you to run me down on the second part again and I'll, I'll deep dive on that one for you. Yeah, just to summarize the first part is kind of what I thought, just keep track of your waist, keep track of your pant sizes. It's the easiest way. And then the second part would be, let's say you have someone that works out all the time, like you were a power lifter, right? Like you don't care way more about what to look at, what kind of numbers to dive into. Where should someone like that be looking? What are we checking? Are we checking circumference of our arm size? Or are we checking different body fat based on regions? Are we checking different areas of visceral fat? What are we looking at? I, I really think it comes down to the same thing. When you're looking at where risk lies and how to keep track or keep yourself in check, there are things like hip to waist ratio and what that ratio is. It's uh, your your waist to height ratio and, and how that assesses. And that's where you, you shift away from BMI, okay? Because you can have someone that's 91 kilos and five foot one with a 37 inch waist. And you have someone that's six foot and 91 and they've got the same waistline. So they're clearly in better shape because they're taller. It's distributed differently. Um, so it's one of those things where waistline is the primary measure. If you look at even the NHS in the US, then National Health Service, they focus now on waistline. That is the thing that they're trying to compensate for, or actually the wrong word, combat in the UK is that expanding waistline of the English population. And that's what they're looking at more so. They've pretty much thrown BMI out the window and doing a lot of things in the National Health Scheme to bring people into understanding the risk that their waistline provides them. So whether you're a, a super lean fit bodybuilder or you're somebody that's carrying too much weight, the risk categorization is the same when it comes to waistline. And that is where you look at it. And generally what you find is, and we found this in the studies that people that are doing strenuous exercise tend to have lower visceral fat levels. So it tends to bring that that internal, you know, risky fat down in their, in their bodies compared to people that are of the same weight that might do different kinds of sports. It's got a direct correlation to extreme exercise and how that, that correlates to the reduction in visceral fat as well. Interesting. So even if it's a like lighter cardio or lightweight lifting, it's a different type of body fat you're burning off that more people that do more strenuous and hard, like that hit kind of workout we've always talked about, those people end up losing more visceral fat than those that just go and kind of meander around, do a couple of lifts here and there. Yeah, I, th I don't know the exact science behind it, but when we were looking at the study and we ran quite an extensive one around that reduction, we found in men that were hitting the gym hard, they were the same body weight as other men um, in age, weight and so on, were much lower in visceral fat than the, the men that weren't doing with the runners or the cyclists and that sort of thing versus the guys in the gym hitting the weights. The fit guys are the fit guys. They're both in that low risk category based on how much visceral fat there was just less of it. And when we go back to what we were talking about earlier with the skinny fat people, we did a huge study through Asia where we're looking at the, the manner in which the Asian populace carry body fat comparatively to Caucasians. And that is a perfect example of skinny fat. Now, the Caucasian race being yourself or myself, it's usually in the mid to late 40s, we start to get that, that elevation in visceral fat in the in particular in Taipei, when we did a study on the Chinese population, we had 8,000 people in the study. And um, we found that males from the age of 22 to 25 had the same sort of visceral fat levels as Caucasians at 45 to wow. 50. And the females were coming in at 25 to 29 as the same as women in, in the category Caucasian up around the 50s and 55s because they, they have that high carbohydrate diet that really gives them very, um, if you like, deep fat levels on their body, even though they're quite small people. So when you see someone in Asia that's actually very large, they are really at risk because even the smaller people that aren't taking care of themselves have this huge visceral fat issue 
going on. It was quite frightening to their National Health Service when we showed them the study uh, that we'd done because we, we didn't do it. It wasn't a guesstimate. It wasn't fat calibers. We DEXA scanned every one of these people and compared them against our technology as our ground truth to understand. And the study that came out from it was just frightening. That's, that's crazy. I'm like so mind blown. And I don't, I don't know if it's just because I'm like, like you, I'm so in love with the health and fitness field. That's, I didn't know that because mm. you see it all the time. Like the Asian cultures they're they look thinner. They just have that thinner look. And I've, I've known about skinny fat, but I didn't realize how predominant visceral fat was in those cultures based upon, I guess, what they're eating. And it's very, very intriguing. And just thinking about it out loud, kind of, I guess they'd have more of a risk of developing cardiovascular disease and getting really sick because they'll know that they don't know they have high levels of visceral fat unless they get DEXA scan. So it makes Correct. it way harder to be like, well, you know what? I need to lose some weight because I look skinny. You don't know. Yeah, no, that's it. And that's why they had some of the highest incidence in the world of type 2 diabetes. Because when you're looking at high body fat, whether you're a Caucasian, any nationality, if you've got high body fat, the risk of type 2 diabetes is much higher. So you can be a small person and you'd think, well, how can I possibly have that issue? But it's because of the, the if you like, the density of the amount of fat to weight ratio you're holding on your body. Wow, that's so intriguing. And that was actually going to be my next question anyway. And maybe you have something, another interesting fact to add into that was, did you notice anything when you were doing these global studies based upon different regions? Was there anything else besides the Asian culture, maybe US compared to UK or Australia compared to Europe, anything else that really stood out? Well, you find regionally because of eating habits, the, the, the body fat, um, if you like, the density of, or the amount of population that has has a higher body fat levels it is really diet related in different regions. What we really found from the studies that we did is how you know northern Indian versus southern Indian um, people have totally different body compositions and how they hold body fat. Uh, across Asia, the the Chinese versus the Indonesians were different. When you come to the Caucasian race, whether it you know European in the US, here in Australia, UK, as Caucasians, we generally hold fat the same. So when we did the study and trained the algorithm, it would really categorize people quite comfortably the same. When you went to, into Asia and, you know, at the end of the day, India is an Asian country too. They are so different in the way both they eat, metabolize their food and retain body fat. Wow. That's, this is all mind blowing to me. I love this. I love the interesting facts that you don't get day to day. And I want you to tie this into what you guys are doing. So advanced human imaging, you're, you're I don't want to explain it. You did such a good job explaining to me earlier about what it was and how you can use your product to really keep yourself accountable, especially coming in the new year. So Vlado, tie this all together for us, please. Yeah, listen, absolutely. So what we've created is a mobile phone based capturing technology. So uh, we work with partners around the world. Um, in the US, we work with a number of different partners. One of the, the companies we're launching with down there is the guys from Fitplan, uh, sorry, I should say Fit Labs, who uh, work with Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather and a number of the big gym um, names and so on. And uh, what we do is we provide a camera-based capturing technology that you, you just download onto your mobile phone. You, you basically, you prop it up against a cup you take some images through the application um, of yourself front and side. And we have some algorithms that we, we run that through that give you very accurate dimension across your body. We track you over 12,000 data points and we hand you back dimension. Great for the gym junkies, I was one. Um, Self-appraisal, being able to look at myself, you know, week to week, day to day with the, the changes I'm, I'm going through. In addition to that, and why we talked about the whole cop um, body composition side of things earlier, was because we've worked for the last five years and spent millions of dollars building out a, a medical based algorithm around body composition. And we did that by actually training the, the captures that we got and the algorithms we've built with DEXA scans and tens of thousands of those around the world of different nationalities, male, female, heights, weights, and so on, um, and put them through DEXA scanning and trained our algorithm to be able to, to do this. So. Uh, I'll give you a, for instance, I had a DEXA scan and I blind test myself against our app 
and our application against the DEXA scan was less than 1% variance between our application and the actual uh, DEXA scan. Now, a DEXA machine is a $200,000 machine. In the US, uh, they range from $60 to have one scan to $120. In Australia, they're about $90 to $120 to have one scan. Um, in Australia, we're allowed to have two of those a year. In the US, I think they're a little bit more lenient uh, with how many you can have a year. But at the end of the day, if you could use a mobile phone application where it's done privately and assesses you on your own mobile phone, it doesn't get shared in the cloud with anybody else. You're not exposed to any sort of data privacy issues because it's processed and actually ran on your own mobile phone. It gives you back that data and you can do that regularly. I think it's the way to go. So you know, we built this technology out company's called Advanced Human Imaging, and um, it's exactly what we do. We, we empower you to self-assess using your own mobile phone and track that longitudinal change through the history of all the avatars that are created through the imagery we do of you and the captures that we do. It's such an amazing technology. So where do you see this going in the future? What's the next step for you guys? Uh, you know, I started in that whole world of health and fitness, and then we did a small pivot into assisting a number of companies that want to be able to fit you with your clothing online because you know everything you buy online never works, never fits, it never fits. So one. true. Always <laughs> a fair on that model, and I put it on, and I said, "Why don't I look like that guy? He looks so good." Um, so you know, it, it's that's one thing we do, but we've really taken it deeper with what's happened with COVID the last two years, and people wanting to be able to. You know, assess their health remotely and not have to go to the medical centre unless they need to and so on. Uh, we've, we've done a lot more than that and we've worked with um, a number of global organisations and looked at a number of global organisations like World Health Organisation, International Diabetes Federation and so on and looked at what are the things that they measure to calculate or understand the risk on an individualised basis. Then we've looked at what doctors do when you walk into a doctor's surgery and I can tell you, you walk into the doctor's surgery, he pops you on the scale and checks your heart rate, he does your blood pressure. And the first thing he does when you walk in, he looks at your waistline to say, when, think, am I sending this bloke out for a couple of blood tests to see if he's prone to you know, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and so on. So what we've done with the technology over the last two years, is we've, we've brought some other technologies in, some of them we've acquired, some of them we've partnered with, but you know, now we do a number of things, and it's not just that assessment we do, the body scanning, which gives you all the dimensions if you're just a health nut like you and I, and you just want to know, are you maintaining the body weight, reducing it, growing, whatever? Uh, we've taken a layer deeper, we've built composition into that that gives people a way to track if their body fat levels are reducing, if that's what they're trying to do. From a medical aspect, we've brought um, transdermal imaging, which is imaging the blood flow in the face through video capture on the phone, and again, in the phone, not out in the cloud where we look at the blood flow in the face and we've ha we have a number of calculations that runs to give you back blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and irregular heart rate if you have that. Um, so these are these are the things the doctor looks at. So what I've tried to do is build a triaging tool so that if you are not able to get to the doctor, but you're doing you know, this sort of thing with your doctor, you're doing a telehealth call where he wants to understand you know, what is your blood pressure, your heart rate, and so on. It's not when you've just come into his surgery and he's put the blood pressure cup on you and doing the tests, but he can actually get that through the the, uh, the actual um, event as it's happening on screen using this camera that we're talking on right now. We can actually do the transdermal imaging and give him blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate at, at the same time. And that's just such a vital part of a doctor visit that he understands that dynamic. More importantly, we do this for next to nothing. So if the doctor wants to know that you know, I'm on course on a daily basis, how's my blood pressure, how's my heart rate, and all those things because I've carried a bit too much weight. These are things that through the app can be logging into your medical records freely as you want to, to keep him up to date. We've taken a layer deeper and we bring in muscular skeletal assessment back into our world where we look at are you squatting properly, are you prone to injury, what's your gait, what's your strength and pivot capabilities. You know, using again the video capability of the mobile phone to actually uh, assess someone's movement when they're doing something and give them a score back and then recommendations on how to improve if need be um, on those things. We've brought an ability into the phone 
to do uh, derma scanning, which is looking at you know things like skin cancers, lesions, rashes, and so on. Then people just leave it. They just leave it, thinking it's nothing. And then all of a sudden they get it checked, and they're two years in on a on you know a, a, a cancer that they should have dealt with years earlier. And if you catch these things early, it's important. And if you go and see a GP half the time, it's not their specialty. So they'll either want to try to get you into a derma or they cut it off. Now that's not what you want to do. So we've got a eight year deep build of a dermatology library that gives you 588 skin conditions across 133 categories, wow. right? And and this is being used by over 20,000 clinicians worldwide. We just got CE approval in Europe in all 27 EU countries for it to be a medical device. We're in FDA at the moment. We're approved in Canada to do that. So we're a bit more than just a fitness tool. We, start, we started in yours and my world, right, where you know, a bit of vanity and good health is what we were trying to look after. And now we're, we're deeper diving into letting the doctor know where you sit, triaging you to good care if you need it. And the final piece of the puzzle is a, a company we're working with out of Boston that have a remote blood testing capability with a little Bluetooth dongle that comes out and it Bluetooths into the phone, comes out with a micro prigging device in your blood strip, and you can do the bloods analysis at home to provide to your care carer, your insurer, your doctor, and so on. Again, across chronic diseases, that that's my lane. The chronic disease risk side of things, where seventy percent of the global deaths come each year, is the lane we're trying to, if you like, go the fastest in to give people an ability to take care of themselves. That's you just took like, doo, that was amazing. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. You basically just took everything in fitness and medicine and you, you brought it together and it's just amazing because that's literally what we're doing. We're trying to blend and our, even our slogan as a company is fitness is medicine. So I absolutely love that you're putting everything together under one package to say, this is how you can take care of yourself. This is how you can track yourself and put all of that preventative medicine side aspect into it. So Correct. Yeah. And I think that if you look at the industry now, there's a blurring of the lines between wellness, fitness, insurance, and medical. There really is. You've, there's this merging of those, those tides, if you like, of doctors wanting to know more about your fitness and getting you in with trainers, insurers getting involved in how you look after yourself and and lose weight and take better care yeah there's a, a perfect example would be john hancock there in the us they'll only insure you if you have a wearable because they want to know you're active they don't they, they want to take on people that are trying to take care of themselves and they underwrite people that are willing to move willing to do something and they help you get healthier and they help you manage that that it's good for them because it creates you know sticky policy holders that are being taken care of and then they're able to give you more cover for less you know, expense because you are actually actioning your own health. So it's um, it, it's good for both sides. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's really the next step. And you're seeing it little by little instead of just you go to the gym and get an insurance reimbursement. It's time for insurance companies to step up, pay for preventative medicine like personal training because you might go to a gym, but you don't know what the heck you're doing. And that's a whole nother story. And you can go listen to the episodes about that. So it's important to really go for the people that really want to keep you health, active and healthy and overall happy to be the best version of yourself. And that's how we started it. Absolutely. So, last po last question, just where can people find you, get a hold of you, and then summarize this and give the last summary of 2021 for this show. Go for it, Vlado. Yeah, so this, it's a long one. I, I really tried to get www.ahi.com that got taken so it's it's the the usual www.advancedhumanimaging.com is where we are heaps of videos there for people to look at on the different functionalities we've got plenty there that they can look at deep dive there's ways to contact us um, if they they want to get access and um, you know what we're trying to do is you know democratize healthcare we're trying to give people access to redefining health and understanding their own risk because no one does everybody likes to think we're fine but we're just not yeah and yeah. like we always say redefine your health i love that and thank you guys for joining us on this week's episode of health and fitness redefined don't forget hit that subscribe button and join us next week as we dive deeper into this ever-changing field and remember fitness is a journey not a destination until next year
See you then.